So yeah, so last time what we did is that uh, I gave a couple of uh, ideas how uh, particle physics evolved, like the story behind the particle physics evolution of the field and what we do in particle physics. So a few uh, ideas on what we're doing were all, all read last week. So what we would do today is more or less um, doing some exercises hands-on. Um, so before we do that, um, actually I have shared uh, the link to the exercises in the Zoom chat. So just uh, confirm, please confirm if you can access that, open that, and then I'll tell you what exactly to uh, do. Once you confirm, you can uh, access that link. Can someone confirm they can open it? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, just to give a recap of what we did last time. So maybe uh, uh, what we did last time was uh, we asked these questions, what we are made of, where we are coming from, what is our destiny, where are we headed? And then we discussed a few early ideas, uh, how early civilization thought about these questions, their ideas about the structure of the universe and things like that. Uh, then uh, we also convinced us uh, science is the science is a better tool to answer these questions, uh, unlike how ancient civilizations thought. So then we also reviewed the status of science, various kinds of sciences at different uh, length scales, like uh, uh, in biology, neuroscience, and sociology uh, is the science of. Uh, uh, things which are uh, affecting human beings directly uh, in in this length scale like of order of one meters so that's the size of the human beings and then if you go into larger uh, sizes larger length scales you have astrophysics um, cosmology and stuff and we also said we are mainly concerned about this lower end of this length scale when we come into particle physics and then we also reviewed uh, the whole evolution of uh, the atomic theory proposed by John Dalton and Mendeleev's periodic table. And we also reviewed this particularly interesting experiment, which was done by Rutherford, um, uh, which is the alpha particle scattering experiment. And uh, the discovery of neutrons, then people also discovered cosmic rays and we, once we started observing or measuring cosmic rays, we also found a lot of new particles coming from these cosmic rays. So we understood, oh, it's not just neutrons, protons, and electrons. There are also other particles in nature. It was just a matter of looking for them. And then uh, we also discussed how people started building uh, accelerators uh, to make these new particles discovered in the cosmic rays in a laboratory environment. Um, and once we started doing that, we started seeing a, a zoo of a lot of particles and then someone had to come and put all these things in a particular table in order to make sense out of uh, what it is like, just like how Mendeleev did. And then uh, along with that organization of these particles in this kind of scheme, um, there was also a theory called the quark model, which explains that all these particles, including neutrons and protons and the new particles that was discovered in the cosmic rays, they all had a substructure. Like they are all made up of a, a more basic constituent of matter, which are called quarks. And then we also discussed uh, what are the kinds of quarks. There are six quarks in the nature, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. And then there are these uh, kind of particles called uh, leptons, which are basically electrons, which we are all familiar of, then muons, which is a heavier sister of electron, which is 200 times more massive than, uh, uh, than the electron. Then also comes a tau particle, which is also a particle which behaves like electron and which also is quite heavier than the electron of muon. And then we also discussed the uh, four known fundamental forces in the universe. Uh, this is uh, gravitation, electromagnetism, um, strong force, which is responsible for holding the quarks inside the nucleus, um, and the weak force, uh, which is responsible for uh, causing radioactivity. And then we uh, 
also uh, spoke a little bit about this particular guy here right on top, which is called the Higgs boson, um, which is actually giving mass to uh, all the known fundamental particles. So uh, the particles like the up quark, down quark uh, in both, I mean, all three generations and the leptons, these uh, also get masked by interacting with the Higgs particle. And, uh, oops. Yeah, so uh, Higgs particle was proposed by this particular guy called Peter Higgs, and uh, he proposed this idea in 1960s, and he got Nobel Prize for the yeah, proposal of the Higgs particle after this particle was discovered after 40 years. So Higgs was, even though it was proposed in 1964, it was uh, discovered only in 2012. Uh, so this is all about the discovery of Higgs particle in 2012. And then uh, you also saw this picture of standard model in the context of wider structure of matter, like uh, from the biologicals down to the molecules, to the atoms and the quarks. And the structure or this table of quarks and leptons is also governed by a mathematical equation, which I didn't tell you too much about, but uh, there is a mathematics behind the organization of particles like this in this table. And then we also um, discussed a little bit of details about uh, the experiment which detected the Higgs boson, which is the Large Hadron Collider that's built in the French-Swiss border. At, um, uh, and um, yeah, so also explained a little bit about how complicated these instruments are and how uh, uh, Higgs boson decays and production of other particles in the detector would look like and how we make some fancy looking plots like these to actually infer the results of our experiments. And then I also mentioned a little bit about um, uh, whether this knowledge that the current day particle physics gives us is this complete. Um, and we also discussed a little bit about the dark matter uh, dark energy and stuff, um, which you had some questions about. So I was happy to answer some of those questions. So if you have more questions, that would also be welcome today. Uh, and we also spoke a little bit about uh, the matter budgeting of the universe. So the universe uh, of all the known matter in the universe, uh, just 5% is uh, the visible matter. So this is the matter that we see around. This is earth, this is wind, air, whatever you, you see around. And this is also, uh, if you look up the sky, the number of stars that you see, the galaxies. So everything, all of that is just 5% of the known matter. Then this is dark matter, which is 27%, uh, which only interacts via gravitational force, which is not known to interact via other forces of nature. Uh, and then there is other 68%, which is dark energy, which is responsible for causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. Um, and the, 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 there are open questions in, uh, in today's particle physics, what is this dark matter and dark energy and stuff. So uh, we also discussed these open questions are quite interesting and also good for young generations to pursue uh, so that would, I mean, these are quite curiosity in walking questions. So, uh, would be good uh, uh, to, for you to join in this journey of five or six. Also, discuss how you could uh, contribute or be part of this. A uh, couple of ways. One is to join the Beamline for Schools at CERN. So, this is a program conducted by CERN for high school students. Uh, doesn't really have to be uh, high school. You could also do if you are in higher secondary as well. Uh, here, the basic idea is you just, uh, um, there will be applications called for uh, this particular program. And then you, along with a few of your friends, make a proposal to run an experiment at CERN. And then um, you, if you are selected for the program, then you will get to spend two months in Geneva uh, in summer and then get to do stuff uh, with the scientists working on experiments in Geneva. So yeah, so that, that would be quite cool because you, you get to spend two months of your summertime in Europe, which is like, uh, actually quite nice time to be in Europe. 
And then you could also, uh, if you don't want to do that, or uh, you would still want to go back after doing that, you could also apply to the CERN summer school program, which is basically for students who had moved out of higher secondary school. So if you are in your undergrads at college, uh, whatever discipline you are, be it engineering or pure sciences, physics, uh, uh, you can apply for this program. And if selected, you will spend again a couple of months at CERN during summer, which is also quite a nice time. Uh, you will also see other people uh, from different countries uh, who uh, are excited to do particle physics just like you, and you will uh, probably make a lot of friends during these programs. Yep, so that's all what we did last time. Um, so this is also, uh, I mean, what I'm doing is a review of what we did last time. So if you have any questions, you could also ask now. So um, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so you all can open this link, right? So what we will be doing is we will uh, go through uh, there are a couple of things to do with uh, some small exercises uh, just to get your hands hands dirty. Uh, so this kind of learning, learning by doing, will also help you to you know that's another way of uh, teaching. Uh, it's not just me who would speak; you would also get to uh, do things by yourself, and that's also an important aspect of learning. So what we um, yeah, so what, what we hope to achieve during this hands-on is to uh, understand a few things that are, we have spoken about. That's about the atomic nuclear, what is it made up of and stuff. Uh, and then we also discussed briefly that these particles, like the Higgs bosons, uh, they don't live forever. Like uh, when they're produced in proton-proton collisions at LHC, uh, they don't, they're not going to stick around for a long time. So they would immediately decay into something else. They would die and become something else. So that's called the lifetime of particles and different particles have different lifetimes. Uh, the Higgs boson uh, actually has a lifetime of uh, a, a very small number, which is equivalent to one divided by uh, 10 to the power of 22. That means one divided by one and 22 zeros. So one and 22 zeros is a very large number. So one divided by one and 22 zero is extremely small number. Uh, so that much seconds, that's what uh, the lifetime of Higgs boson is. And then we also discussed a little bit about how magnetic field affects uh, charged particles. Like uh, this is how particle energies are measured in the um, Atlas detector. Uh, or any other particle physics detector. So what you would do is you would immerse the detector in a magnetic field and when charged particles travel through this magnetic field, uh, they actually bend. So if you can measure the, then we can ask the other question, if I can measure the bending of this charged particle tracks or if I can measure the curvature of these tracks, can I uh, actually infer the energy of these particles? So that's, uh, we will do a few, well, actually one exercise regarding this and then uh, hopefully you'll be able to appreciate it. Um, so, um, yeah, so we also reviewed this table a little while ago. So this is a table of standard model of particle physics, the uh, up, down type of quarks, up, down, charm, strange top, bottom, and uh, these leptons. So this is, uh, um, this is the uh, structure of standard model. Now, um, there are some questions here. Uh, uh, there's one coming up here. Um, what is the simplest atom? The hydrogen atom is the smallest atom. What is, 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 what is it made up of? There are a couple of options here. You can fill it up and click submit. So one electron, one proton, one neutron, one electron and one neutron. So yeah, so go ahead. So I, I'll a, give you, yeah, you can, you can answer. You can click, click on that and then click submit. So done. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so the question was, uh, what is hydrogen atom? 
right? So it's the smallest known atom. It is the simplest element. What is it made up of? So I got a couple of answers here. Uh, so someone, someone says it's just one electron. So that, that can't be true, right? Electron is negatively charged. So hydrogen atom is electrically neutral. So there must be something else which is balancing the charge of that negative electron. Uh, so it at least need to have an extra positive charge, right? So um, what could that be? Can anyone speak up? I don't, I don't worry. I mean, you, you spoke, right? So it's just, it's okay. Like, it's just, yeah, go ahead. What was that? One electron and one proton. Great. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that is the correct answer because um, there must be something that balances the, uh, the negative charge of the electron. So it has to be a proton. But then you, some of you got uh, another answer. Some of you say it's one electron, one neutron, and one proton. Now, this is also quite possible because the new, neutron is neutral charge, right? So one electron, then uh, one proton balancing that negative charge of the electron. And um, you, what's the problem in adding another, uh, another neutral particle to the nucleus? Uh, this is also in some sense true, but this is um, the isotope of hydrogen. So hydrogen has a different form of itself, which is called uh, a deuterium. So you probably have heard about hydrogen, deuterium, tritium. So these are certain isotopes of hydrogen. So what happens here is, uh, for example, in deuterium, uh, the nucleus of the deuterium atom uh, has one proton and one neutron. And then of course, one electron which is moving around it. Uh, so that's also in some sense correct, but it's a heavier cousin of hydrogen atom. The simplest atom is the hydrogen atom, which has just one electron and, and one proton. Okay. Uh, so now let's go to the next exercise, exercise number two. So um, now that you know about the hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom has one electron and one proton. Uh, so you know uh, the nucleus is made up of uh, protons and neutrons. For example, hydrogen nucleus is just one proton, but for example, deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen has one proton and one neutron. Now, if you go to higher elements like uh, carbon, I think carbon has six, yeah, six protons and six neutrons. Carbon has an atomic number of, uh, uh, well, mass number of 12, so it has to be six protons and six neutrons. Uh, so the question here is, um, well, protons are of course positively charged particles and neutrons uh, do not have charge. Now, uh, here's the question. So all the atoms are made up of first generation particles in the standard model. So which means all the particles are made by these kind of particles. So you have an up quark, a down quark, an electron, etc. Uh, so uh, that is the up down and electron. So uh, the charge of the up type quark is plus two third. Uh, that's positive two over three, and the charge of the down type quark is negative one third. Now I have two questions here. What is the quark content of a proton? Uh, so proton is positively charged. Uh, and what is the quark content of the neutron? Neutron is negatively charged. So you have to find uh, how many up and down quarks makes one positive charged proton and how many up and down quarks make a neutral particle like the neutron. Uh, you are given that the charge of the up type quark is plus two third and the charge of down quark is minus one third. So it's about finding the right combination of uh, uh, two thirds and negative one thirds. Yeah, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to do this. So here the problem is uh, how can you make a positive charge out of uh, two uh, positive two third quarks and one negative 
one third charge, right? So if I add uh, two up quarks, what would be the charge of that up quark uh, combination? So that would be uh, two third over two third, right? So that would be the charge of that would be four third, right? Now, what should I add to four third to get one? Or what should I subtract from four third to get one? So that would be uh, if I subtract uh, minus one third or add negative one third, which is the same as subtracting one third, uh, I will get uh, plus four third minus one third, right? So that would be plus one. So uh, yeah, so I got six responses here. So I have, uh, um, yeah, most of you, most of you have got that right. So you all say two up quark and one down quark is a proton and roughly equal number of you uh, say two down quark and one up quark makes the uh, neutral particle, which is a neutron. Yeah, so um, I'll explain what is happening in case of the neutron. So you have uh, uh, two down quarks, right? So that would be the charge of these two down quarks would be minus one third plus minus one third. So that would be minus uh, two third. Now, if I add another up quark to that, so that would be minus two third plus two third. So the answer is uh, the sum is zero. So that would be the charge of the neutron. So we know the charge of the neutron is uh, zero. So the quark content of neutron should be uh, you are the, uh, one up quark and two down quarks. Yeah, so um, yeah, cool. So then let's discuss a little bit about other particles. So now that you know that proton and neutron here, they come with uh, Actually, the answer was here. Uh, a neutron comes with and one up quark and two down quark, and the proton comes with two up quarks and one down quark. So is that the only possibility? Are there other particles? So we also discussed last time and brief, brief, reviewed this briefly today um, uh, in the earlier um, section of this um, uh, this this class that uh, there are other particles which were discovered in the cosmic rays, like. Uh, People observe that the particles coming from outer space hitting the Earth's upper atmosphere and doing some funny stuff. And uh, even in accelerators, people were able to generate other, I mean, we call the bound states of these particles. So here, in this case, this funny looking character, this is sigma. This is a Greek character. So this particle is labeled by this uh, Greek character sigma. And the sigma minus is made by two down quarks and one strange quark. So what's happening here? So uh, two down quarks and one strange quark. So that's that's the quark content of the sigma minus particle. And then there is this lambda particle, which is neutral and um, which has a one up quark, one down quark, and a strange quark. So you would see immediately that uh, the up quark has a charge content of positive to the two third. Uh, the down quark has a, a charge of negative one third. Uh, and what is the charge of the strange quark? So if you go up here, uh, strange quark uh, comes in the second row here, all the particles in the second row has a charge of negative one third. So lambda zero, which is UDS, uh, has one up quark, one down quark, and one strange quark. So plus two third minus one third minus one third. So the total charge is zero. Um, so likewise, the uh, other particles. Uh, so this particular funny looking organization of um, particles uh, was first done by someone called Murray Gelman. Uh, so I believe, yeah, there are eight particles here. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, yeah. And for that reason, it's called the uh, eightfold way. And one peculiarity is that uh, all the particles in this organized in this diagonal uh, have the same charge. So, uh, so here, sigma uh, and this particular particle down here has a negative charge. And all the particles on this axis also has a negative charge. 
uh, I'm sorry, it's neutral charge, the neutrons, lambda zeros and sigmas, all of them have neutral charge. And the particles here along this axis, all of them have positive charge. So sigma plus is positive, proton is positive. Um, yeah, so this you also know, uh, particles are produced in the cosmic rays. Um, and here I would like to uh, show you something uh, which, yeah. So I spoke about cosmic rays in the last class as well, I think. So particles from outer space come and hit Earth's atmosphere and then they produce the secondary particles. So these particles like pi on scale and everything is produced also in the, um, uh, in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays hit. So to briefly illustrate this, there are many sources. So where does these cosmic rays come from? Cosmic rays are coming from um, uh, intergalactic space. Some of them are coming from um, uh, the, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are certain things called supernova explosions. So whenever a star enters its last phases of its life, uh, it suddenly explodes. And in this explosion, uh, charged particles are accelerated and they can fly in our direction. And um, these particles, uh, because, um, yeah, uh, because Earth has an atmosphere, uh, these particles are not directly, well, they reach directly at the, they reach at the surface of the Earth in some sense but uh, they first interact uh, with the particles in the upper atmosphere layer and they lose a little bit of energy and then subsequently their daughter particles reach here. So as you can see here, the primary cosmic ray, which probably let's say is a proton and it, it interacts with the uh, atoms or the nucleus of the, uh, the nitrogen and oxygen atoms in the upper atmosphere and then does a lot of uh, secondary particles and then finally on the surface of the earth, you get these particles, muons uh, and stuff like that. So this, the energy of these particles would be reduced um, because of the, uh, because the primary cosmic ray lost its energy in the first interaction and you would only get a fraction of these energy on uh, of these particles here uh, on the surface of the earth. So for this reason, uh, we do not have uh, much of uh, radiation background on the surface of the Earth compared to other planets like Mars or even the surface of the Moon for that matter. Uh, so the atmosphere saves us from uh, a few of harmful radiations in this sense. So here uh, what I'm showing is uh, the, uh, the activity of the Sun. So the Sun sends out certain radiations and because uh, the Earth has a magnetic field, these uh, radiations uh, would be somehow deflected because charged particles uh, kind of get deflected in the magnetic field. And uh, because of the Earth's magnetic field, uh, the solar rays, uh, sorry, the, uh, the solar activity is not really washing out the atmosphere of the Earth. So this is quite crucial for the life on Earth. Uh, if there was no magnetic, um, uh, uh, there was no magnetic field for the Earth, then things would have been quite different for the fate of the life life on Earth. So you can see here. So what you see here is uh, they have put, they're looking into the sun and they put a mask here so that they don't get blinded by the bright uh, rays from the sun. And this sort of uh, picture is called a coronagraph. So they can see what the sun is doing. So you can see a lot of things flying past the sun. So this is really showing the activity of the sun. See, there are things that 
uh, ejected very violently. And all these things that you see here, these moon stuff, these are other planets in the solar system. So you, you, you can see them in the background of this corona graph. So these things, you see these violent explosions, these are not very small, these are really huge. And sometimes some of them uh, are sent in the direction of the earth. So yeah, so this is uh, another view of the surface of the sun. So the sun is bright, uh, but it's also very dynamic. You can see these kind of massive explosion kind of things happening on the surface of the sun. Uh, and these things sent out um, yeah, uh, radiations in the direction of the Earth. Sir? Yes. In this, are they uh, going close to the sun in this footage? Are they going what? Closer to the sun? Is that the yes. question? They are actually coming from the sun. So the sun is in the center. Okay. And uh, the sun emits these things. So. Uh, let me start from here. So you see this? Oops. Yeah. So these are coming out of sun. So this is the surface of the sun, right? So these uh, loops of things and even uh, explosions that you see sometimes, this is called solar activity. Um, so it's sending out particles while this is happening. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so when these particles reach, uh, these radiations reach Earth's atmosphere, you could also uh, uh, get cosmic rays from the solar activity, okay? Then we go to a topic which uh, most of you probably have heard. This is called the special theory of relativity. Um, uh, so the basic idea here is that this is not like the usual physics, like the Newtonian physics that you learned. Um, uh, force uh, equals mass time acceleration. So you probably have heard uh, equations like that of objects continue to move uh, unless acted uh, upon by an external force. These are some statements of the Newton's, Newton's laws of motion. Uh, so here, uh, special theory of relativity takes this Newtonian laws of motion to a different level and some sometimes uh, at very high particles moving at very high speeds, the Newton's laws of motions are not valid anymore. So for those kind of particles, uh, you have to apply the theory of relativity. Uh, so yeah, so according to the theory of relativity, uh, speed of light is the ultimate speed that one can attain in nature. So any particle uh, cannot be accelerated or cannot move faster than the speed of light. Um, and this, this, yeah, I mean, uh, and also uh, according to this theory, uh, photons or the particles of light, uh, this has uh, no mass. Uh, so they cannot really, um, you know, uh, be affected or they cannot be really attracted uh, by, by a force of gravity. Now I need to make a clarification here. So many of you may have wondered, so if light particles are not uh, massive, then how can light be bent? Uh, there are certain observations like gravitational lensing where massive objects like um, galaxies or even black holes bend light when light uh, goes uh, somewhere close to them. And if light is directly a shot into a black hole, the black hole would absorb light. So why does this happen? So uh, again, uh, credits goes to Einstein in explaining this. So Einstein's way of explaining this is that gravity actually changes the uh, curvature of the space time. Like if you have a massive object, it's like putting a ball or heavy object in a rubber sheet kind of thing. We also had a brief discussion about this last time. So light, actually would curve in this rubber sheet. So the trajectory of light, the path of the light would curve according to the curvature of the space-time. 
Um, and that's how uh, Einstein explains the bending of light in the presence of a magnetic field. So it's true that light will not be accelerated or light will not experience a force uh, by uh, the gravitational direction, but its path can be changed, its velocity or its, its speed cannot be changed with uh, gravitation, but its path can be changed with gravitation. Um, so again, you know, uh, Einstein has this uh, famous equation um, called E equals mc square, um, where uh, m is the mass of the particle and c is the um, uh, speed of light. Um, and uh, you have this equation uh, which gives the energy which is given by mass times the square of the velocity. So that's mc square. Uh, and yeah, so if the particle is, this one is only true when the particle is in rest. Now suppose let's say the particle is in motion. So a particle of mass m moves with a velocity, with a speed, let's call that speed v. Then there is a specific quantity associated with these particles, which is called the momentum. Um, and this is given by the product of the mass of the particle and the speed, which is V of the particle. So the momentum is given by uh, mass times velocity mv. Uh, so for that kind of a situation, uh, the E equal to mc squared takes slightly different form. Uh, it now becomes m squared times c squared to the power of two, that becomes c to the power of four plus p square c squared under a square root. So this would be the expression for the mass for the particles which has a velocity. Now I have a, a relativistic energy calculator here. You can slide these things and you can click this button. You see here there is a, an arrow button. If you click that, uh, it should work. Yes, I think it did. So yeah, so you get a different value. So if you can change, let's say you start with the um, okay, this is stuck now, give me a second. So I set the speed to be, uh, yeah, I can, I can choose the range of uh, the speed, right? So from zero to hundred. And I can also change the mass between one and 10 here. So you see on the right hand side, what is the mass and our across this row on the right hand side, you see what's the speed I chose. And I can calculate what is the uh, energy. So here, if I choose a speed of 32 units, uh, I don't want to complicate uh, things by adding a unit. So let's say uh, 32 units and mass by four units, you get energy of 3.6 to the 10 to the power of 14, 14 uh, units of energy. So that's a large amount of energy. So you, the energy content of a matter particle, which is uh, moving even the uh, even at rest itself. Let's do that. So let's start with the zero. So this particle has four units of mass and it is not moving. So that itself has a huge energy content. So let's now move on to the next exercise. Um, so we spoke a little bit about uh, this eightfold way, you saw some of these particles here. And uh, another particle you can think of in this kind of a periodic table is called the B plus meson. So this is a bundle, this is a, a quark and anti-quark put together. So in this case, that would be a B quark and an up quark. So that would be, uh, that would be this, an up quark and a B quark. So a two quark system. Now, um, the question is, um, so when these particles are produced in high energy collisions, uh, they die almost instantaneously. So they'll have a lifetime of 1.6 uh, into 10 to the power of minus 12. That means uh, it lives only for a very fraction of a second that is equal to 1.6 divided by 10 and 12 zero. So that's what this expression means. So that, uh, so this particle has an extremely short lifetime. 
Now, assuming these tra particles traveling at the speed of light, uh, the question is, uh, what is uh, the distance they travel before they die? Uh, so I have, uh, uh, yeah, a distance calculator here. So you have to uh, actually, yeah, I had the answer there. So oh, I hope you didn't see it. So if I have a lifetime of uh, uh, one second, then the distance traveled would be the product of these two, the lifetime times the uh, speed. Speed of light is three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second. Uh, so if that's the case, then the distance traveled will be three into 10 to the eight. Now, I, what I want to do is that I have given you what is the lifetime of um, uh, the B plus meson. I want you to calculate uh, the distance traveled by the B plus meson when, uh, before it dies. Okay, can, can you do that? So this is the exercise. Yeah, so all that you have to do is, uh, you, you know, 1.64 into 10 to the power of minus 12 is the uh, lifetime of this particle. Then just find what is this product. You just insert that number here. Okay, so this time all of you have got it right. I have four responses and everybody agrees that it will travel a distance of 4.92 to the 10 to the power of minus four meters. So this is a very small number. So this would mean uh, it's 4.9 meters divided by 10,000 meters. So that is actually very close to um, 0 0.5 millimeters. So if you pick your uh, yeah, geometry box ruler, uh, one millimeter is the uh, least that you can measure in your using your geometry box ruler. So it's just roughly half of that. So uh, a B particle, a B plus meson, which is produced, an accelerator will travel roughly half of that distance before it decays. So uh, this is to just give you an idea how difficult to measure these particles are. So when they are produced, they would immediately decay before traveling too much um, and a uh, particle physicist has uh, some ideas on how to, um, you know, how to measure these things before, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, they, there is no way to measure them directly because they all die before they can be measured. Um, so uh, particle physicists have to come up with some sophisticated ideas on how to measure the existence of these particles in the detector. Uh, yeah, I think I have shown you this plot. This is a cross-section view of Atlas detector. Uh, so proton interactions happen here. And when protons interact, uh, there are a lot of particles coming out of it. And some of these particles are charged particles, some are neutral particles. For example, neutrino this is a neutral particle. It doesn't interact with, uh, it also doesn't interact with any of the detector medium. And then you ha also have electrons, which is quite familiar particle for you. So these are charged particles. Now, when you put a magnetic field, these electrons bend in the magnetic field. So you can see there's, there's a slight curvature for these particles. And if you can measure this curvature, then you can probably tell what is the energy of these particles. So uh, I have uh, an animation here, uh, which tells you how exactly this is done. Uh, so when a charged particles like electrons and protons are put in a magnetic field, they experience some force. Uh, the magnetic field, uh, uh, the, the change in the magnetic field uh, will cause a bend in the trajectory of these paths. So all I want to, you to do is that I have um, given a few sliders here. You can slide uh, the magnetic field slightly like you can choose two units of magnetic field, as you see here, then you can change the electric field to whatever unit you want to, like 0.4 units, all the, I think it goes all the way up to 0.1. Yeah, so you can change the electric field value between uh, point, uh, between zero and 0 0.1. Uh, 
then you can put a positive charged particle, you can either put a negative charged particle, you can choose that. Uh, then you can put the mass, you can put the mass of the particle, for example, one unit or two unit. Um, oops. Then you also can choose the second particle in this animation and yeah, you can put all of them together and see what you what kind of tragic you get. So uh, I would go start with a uh, magnetic field of two and then electric field of uh, 0 0.03 units and then a charge of plus one for both particles. And yeah, same mass. And in this case, both particles should go in the same way. Yeah, so you see that? So I've chosen uh, two particles. Both of them are identical because both of them have the same charge and the same mass. Now, uh, what I would want you to do is change the charge of the particle, uh, put the electric field to zero, uh, and then, uh, yeah, then do it and show me what you get. So here in this case, uh, both of them are positive. So you choose the second particle, the P2, the charge of P2 as negative one and show me what you get. Can you do that? Yes, okay, I'll give you, Yeah, okay, thanks. Can I get that? the same animation? Right. You, you, you're not getting the same animation? So no, sir, I get the same animation only, I don't get it. Okay, great, yeah. So th that the reason is that I, I just did what I asked you to do, so. No, sir, like I changed, even the fields I changed, but still. Really, so what value did you put? Electric or field, I put zero. You put the electric field to zero? Like this? Yes, sir. Okay, so once you do that, you have to again click this run button here. So only then that change will take into effect. Okay, sir. Uh, so I now chose a magnetic field of two units and electric field of zero units. And I put um, one particle as a positive particle and the other particle as a negative particle. So these two particles have exact same mass, that's one unit each. And um, they have just, there's only one difference. They have opposite, opposite charges. An example for these kind of uh, particles is an electron and its antiparticle, the positron. So the only difference between an electron and a positron is that its charges are different. Everything else is the same, okay? Now I put them in the magnetic field. So my particle one is, uh, yeah, I mean, here it is uh, yellow and particle two is blue. Now once I do that and put them in a magnetic field, I see both particles bending in the magnetic field. They do this circular trajectory, right? Uh, but what's interesting is they have different uh, directions of motion. So they bend in opposite directions, right? Now, this is because the charges are different. Now, if I put both particles, let's say I put two electrons. So that for that case, I say my particles, both particles have the mass of one unit and the charge is negative one in the first case and the same in the second case. Now, let me see what comes out. You see only one particle here. Right, but that's because they are tracing the exact same trajectory. They are right on top of each other, so you cannot really distinguish between one and the other. Uh, now let me do something slightly different. My, now let me fix my particle one as the electron, 
and my particle two as a muon. So muon is roughly 200 times more massive than the electron. So uh, I'll have to change the mass of the particle two, but I keep the charge of the particle two as the same as the charge uh, of the first particle. Both electrons and muons have the same charge, so I'll fix them at 91. Now for particle two, I change, oh, actually I cannot change to 200. So let me make it to two, two units of mass. Uh, I, what I want to show you is that if the particle has different masses, they have different uh, curvature of bending. So let me run it through. Sir, I have a doubt. Mm -hmm. So can the electron in the in an atom move anywhere freely? Yes, the electron in the atom, in fact, can move freely and it would move freely, yes. Uh, not completely freely, but uh, more or less freely because uh, there are certain laws of physics uh, for particles in such, um, you know, microscopic scales. Uh, the electron has to obey those laws of physics uh, and this will only allow electrons to do only a specific kinds of motion or restrict certain specific other kinds of motion but yeah the bottom line is that electron does move yeah so then can atoms be used to collide with atoms can an atom yes. be used to collide yeah, atoms can be used to collide other atoms, but the only problem is uh, in order to accelerate the atoms, we don't know a way to, uh, so first of all, if you want to collide two things, we must know a way to throw things at each other, right? Uh, so for two balls, it's quite easy. You can just uh, take two balls and throw at each other, they will collide. But for these extreme small particles like atoms and um, uh, electrons or protons, it's extremely difficult. You cannot hold them and throw. So what we do uh, uh, to throw them at each other is we use, as I said earlier, these devices called accelerators. Now, uh, it would be really easy to accelerate a particle if it has a charge because you can put uh, the charged particle in an electric field and it will experience a force and it can be in some sense thrown. Uh, for atom, it's a bit difficult because the atom is electrically neutral. So you cannot really accelerate the atom to how much ever you like. Uh, but uh, for charged particles, that's much more easy. So that's why we would uh, choose a charged particle like a like a lead nuclei or a gold nuclei, uh, yeah, to, to, to throw at each other. We cannot use a neutral atom, like a gold atom or lead atom to throw at each other. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, sir. Cool. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, I was trying to explain uh, the mass of, if the mass of the particle change and the charge uh, remains the same, there would be some difference in the trajectory of the particle. So that's exactly what you see here. So the blue curve that you see in my screen here, this is particle one, which has a negative charge and a mass of one units. Uh, it has a slightly um, lower radius of curvature, like it's, a, it's doing more curling uh, than the other one. So the other one is a bit massive. So that's why it takes a little bit of time for it to curl one uh, complete curl. Uh, so this is how particle physicists measure the energy of these particles in the detector. So you put these particles in a magnetic field and then they just start moving in along these curved trajectories and you can measure these trajectories uh, and indirectly infer the energy of these particles. Okay, so um, I think that's that's all. Uh, there are a couple of other few exercises, but uh, I don't think uh, we have to do that today. Uh, we can um, discuss this later. Have a, so, yeah. Sir, I have an I have another doubt. Sir, will mm -hmm. like um, the shape of an atom differ? Can the shape of an atom be different 
than pictorial representations? Yes, uh, the shape of the atom uh, is, is completely uh, different from what we see in pictures. Uh, so there is this new kind of physics which governs, uh, so the kind of physics that you know in usual life is Newton's laws of motion. Like when particles hit, they move in different directions. The momentum uh, uh, is conserved when particle hits. But uh, there is a more involved and mathematically uh, complex theory called quantum mechanics, which is governing the laws of physics uh, at microscopic scales or atomic scales. And uh, that, according to that theory, quantum mechanics theory, uh, there is one specific aspect of the quantum mechanical theory, which is called the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So, which simply put, it says. Uh, a particle cannot, uh, yeah, I mean, a particle really cannot be held stationary. It moves with some, yeah, uh, some finite resolution. So there is, a, there is always a movement of this particle. Uh, so the picture that we see about atoms, this is always a, a central nuclei with. Uh, some solid balls in it, and then a small ball electron moving around this atom. That's really not the real picture. It's only showing you uh, at any given instance, you can probably uh, take a snapshot of this whole thing and you might see the sort of a picture. But in the next moment, uh, things could be very different. It will not stay stationary like that. So in that sense, um, at extreme small length scales, uh, the shape of the atom is not really uh, stable always. There are changes in it. So like for example, now we have a clay ball and then inside there are gonna be millions of atoms, right? Yes. So sir, even in that, when we shape the clay ball, will the shape of that atom also change? The shape of the atom uh, will not change but uh, the, the fact that you are shaping the clay ball into something, maybe you sh shape the clay into a ball or a rod or, uh, or something else, this will not change the shape of the atom. But the atom itself, even if you are not doing anything, is doing small uh, uh, orientation changes. So this happens because of these, uh, there are several effects why this would happen. Uh, one one strong reason I can think of this would happen is because of the heat. There, there's a, a thermal fluctuation that uh, that all these materials that you are uh, seeing are subjected to, and that uh, the atoms would respond to this uh, heat energy, and then they would uh, change their shape a little bit here and there. But this is not at uh, length scales, which is uh, something you can perceive when you shape your clay ball. It is happening, all these things are happening at extremely very small length scales. So that would be uh, in, uh, for example, one in uh, 10 to the power of 10. That's one divided by uh, one and 10 zeros. So that's the uh, extremely small length scale at which these changes are happening. You would not notice these changes when you are shaping your clay ball. So, so like if atoms go through no changes, then uh, will an atom be identical or identical to another atom in the same object? The yeah. Same so this place? is a yeah. So this is a very good question. So this is one of the uh, foundational aspect of. Uh, uh, this theory that I described as quantum mechanics. So there is something called uh, quantum distinguishability. It's a complicated word. Uh, the, uh, the question is essentially the same as you asked. Is one atom uh, uh, the same as the uh, another atom of the same element? Uh, on an average, speaking on an average, um, there are certain kinds of atoms which are called, uh, so, so the atoms can be divided into two categories, uh, let's say fermions and bosons. So this is based on how many electrons are there in this 
uh, atom. Uh, so the particles which uh, bosons uh, cannot be distinguished uh, from each other and the particles which are fermions also cannot be distinguished from each other but it's more uh, it's less of uh, how uh, rarely you can distinguish bosons from each other so um, in that sense uh, I would say an atom let's say you take two carbon atoms, uh, which has uh, 12 protons and 12 electrons. Um, and if you take an additional, an extra carbon atom, uh, so you have now two carbon atoms, now you put this in a box and then uh, you somehow shuffle all these things and then now you take out this carbon atom. So you will not be able to tell which was the carbon atom that you put first. I mean, there's no way to look at it and say, um, uh, identify which carbon atom was the one which you put first or the which one which uh, which was the one which you put second uh, when when i say looking at what i mean is doing an experiment and figuring out which uh, atom was the one which you put first so that's not possible so yeah so they are all identical okay sir so but like i had this doubt uh, if if we have a device which can totally separate atoms of the place if a particular place is there and then if we totally take off all the atoms present in that place then what will happen uh, so when you say take you mean remove the atoms like we like totally push apart the art atoms if we can if we totally push apart an atoms from a particular place then what will happen Oh, so this is what we are doing when we are, let's say, pumping out gas from a cylinder. Let's say you, yeah, uh, you try to use a pump and remove air from a, a cylinder, for example. Let's say, so you are in in a sense what you're trying to do is that you are removing the gaseous atoms from the cylinder and taking it out. So uh, this is in a way creating vacuum. So that's what we call as vacuum. So uh, when you take atoms out of a, a gas cylinder, you are essentially creating vacuum. Does that, does that make sense? So sir, so then this universe is like called a vacuum. So does that mean there is no atom in this universe, like in the space, in the black color? So yeah, when, when we say the universe is vacuum, that's not completely true. We always say this in relative terms. So there is at the surface of the earth. Uh, yeah, so let's go back to this previous experiment I was telling you. So you have a cylinder, you're pumping out air from the cylinder and you're trying to create vacuum. So what happens is that all the air which is outside this uh, cylinder will exert a very high pressure for, into the cylinder. So this uh, you're, you're trying, when creating vacuum, you're trying to create an extremely low pressure, so-called low pressure region. Now, uh, when we are talking about the universe, when we say the universe is largely vacuum, what we are really saying is that uh, the, the atoms in that, or the atoms or any other particles in that region uh, is very small. Now, uh, the number of atoms or gaseous molecules at the surface of the Earth, I think it's about one atmospheric pressure. But this will not be the case when you go to outer space. That would be extremely low. So it's not completely absent of atoms. There are still atoms. There are a lot of hydrogen atoms and helium atoms in the, uh, in the intergalactic spaces and stuff. So uh, there are... Uh, atoms out there, but they are not packed as tightly as we have on the surface of the Earth. So there is always a, a you know a degree of how uh, dense these materials are present in different places. So uh, you, on, in the universe, on an average, it's less, but on the surface of the Earth, it's quite high. Yeah, so, so then, what is inside black holes? Are there atoms inside black holes? Good question. Nobody has gone inside black holes. Nobody has sent any probes inside black holes. So we don't know. We don't know what's inside black holes. Uh -huh. so, so because like I've heard that uh, black holes emit radiation. 
so if, if there is a matter inside then only uh, black holes can uh, emit radiation right that's not how black holes emit radiation so black holes doesn't emit radiation from inside so what happens is that a uh, black hole emits these radiations from the outer periphery of the black hole that's that's where it emits these radiations from it's not emitting radiation on inside the black hole does that make sense yes sir Yeah, nice, nice that you're asking questions. Yes, go ahead. Hey, I wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, so how are isot how are different isotopes of same um compound, I mean of same element, is it? Different yeah, isotopes isot of how are they forming? How are they forming? Yes. Okay, so we discussed this a little bit here. Oh, what was that? Yeah. So when we were discussing this hydrogen atom, we said, oh, okay, so the simplest atom is the hydrogen atom. Uh, so it's about the question of how we can uh, form atomic nuclei. So for a hydrogen, at hydrogen nuclei, it's just one proton. And it's perfectly possible that hydrogen uh, nuclei, which is a proton, uh, can combine with a neutron. This happens because um, both protons and neutrons, uh, these are particles which they call interacting via a force called a strong force. So, you know, there's a gravitational force, electromagnetic force, weak force, and a strong force. So, uh, neutrons and protons, they can interact via strong force. So, um, if you put a proton and a neutron together, they can interact via the strong force and hold themselves together. Now, it seems that you can also put three particles together, let's say one proton and two neutrons together. So uh, this is also being held up by this strong force. Uh, so there are certain rules uh, on how, how many particles you can put together um, in this manner. And uh, that's basically, this is the strong force which is holding these extra neutrons together with the proton. And that's how you build isotopes. Um, and these uh, can be artificially created in the laboratories, but you can also uh, form in, uh, uh, in supernovae explosions. Um, when the star dies, this can form. It can also form uh, during uh, the fusion, nuclear fusion reaction, when that happens in the cores of the stars, like the like the sun and other stars. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, sir, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, are two atoms of the same element uh, same or is it identical? Yeah, they are identical. Okay, sir. Okay, any more questions? And does electron in uh, in the atoms move? Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Electrons in the atom smoke. Okay, yeah. So, okay. yeah. so <clears throat> yes. Um, isotopes can be radioactive, also, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Um, so, sir, how to detect whether an isotope is, how to identify whether an isotope is radioactive or not? Yeah. So, uh, so I don't think. Did I say anything about radioactivity? Let me try to find this. Um, sir, can we identify whether an isotope is um, radioactive or not by its composition? Like, if it is, um, can we identify it as radioactive? If it, um, because of this, I mean, if it is having one neutron and another, and one electron and 
uh, the isotope of same element is having a different composition. So can we identify? Yeah, so first of all, uh, let's talk a little bit about radioactivity. So radioactivity was discovered at the beginning of, uh, I think, the last century, 1900s, by Henry Becquerel. So he was doing certain experiments with um, some elements, and he accidentally left these elements uh, very close to a photographic plate. Now, I don't know how many of you know about photographic plates. At least the previous generation knew about film photographs. Uh, these were silver iodide coated uh, plastic sheets. Uh, so when exposed to light, they undergo a photochemical reaction. So that's how back in the days, uh, like me and Sadish Bhai in our younger days uh, made photographs of uh, people. Uh, now you have digital photographs, but okay. So that's the idea. So you, you have an emulsion uh, of silver iodide and then this chemical substance can react to light and uh, you can then get an image of the people when you focus uh, uh, their image onto this particular sheet of uh, uh, film. Um, so photographic plate is even a predecessor to that. It's It was just, a, I think, a sheet metal. And then if you put silver iodide on top of it, uh, and then you uh, irradiate some light on it, uh, like uh, these particles, uh, sorry, the silver iodide material would react with these light materials. Now, Henry Becquerel accidentally put uh, certain silver iodide coated photographic plates very close to uh, some substance he was working in the lab. And then when he came back, he found that all of his plate was spoiled. So this was not very um, uh, clear to him why would that happen. So then uh, he understood that the material that he placed very close to the silver iodide material was emitting certain particles. And uh, it was then this guy, Rutherford, uh, not using this particular experiment, but using another experiment, discovered that uh, certain uh, elements like radium or uranium emits uh, certain particles. And he said these can come in three varieties. Uh, one is this alpha rays, which uh, is like a helium nuclei, uh, two positive charges. Uh, and then um, there is this neutral component, which is also called gamma radiation. And uh, there is a negative component, which is essentially electrons. That's called the beta radiation. So certain radioactive elements or certain elements uh, emit spontaneously these particles, uh, positive charge alpha rays, uh, negative charge beta rays, and neutral particle gamma rays. Now, how, how does this happen? So here, here's how it happens. So in uh, these heavy nuclei, so we are talking about radium, uranium, for example, it has 92, the total number of protons and neutrons in uranium nuclei is uh, actually 232. So uh, it has an atomic number of 92, but um, the mass number is 232. So the sum of protons and neutrons in the uranium atom is 232. So what happens here is that one neutron, now what was a neutron? So let's go back here. Uh, what was that? We did this exercise. Yeah. So. This is a bound state of two neutron, sorry, two, two down quarks and one up quark. Now, one neutron can become a proton by emitting an electron. So, what happens here is, um, oops. yeah, so this neutron has two down type quarks, right? So one of this down type quark, which has a negative charge, negative two third charge, uh, this will become an up type quark by emitting another particle, which will eventually become an electron. So this is how radioactivity happens. So if you want to explain me these details, I will tell you what exactly happens with down type quark. This down type quark uh, will emit a negative charged particle, which is called the Dudley boson. This, this, uh, yeah, this one here, this can come in both positive and negative charges. So this down type quark would become uh, an up type quark by emitting a negative charge particle. Okay. So yes. then 
uh, you have uh, uh, an electron coming out of the nucleus. So that's a, that's a beta beta radiation. So likewise, you can have um, uh, you can have um, so sometimes what happens is some of these particles, these neutrons, proton bound system, they have a higher energy. Uh, this happens because maybe it emitted uh, an electron uh, which is of higher energy. It really didn't completely, uh, I mean, it wasn't emitted from the surface. It was entered somewhere in between. So it lost some of its energy in the material, uh, in this blue ball of both uh, uh, neutrons and protons. And somehow this nuclei now have to shed, uh, it has to shed this extra energy. So this it does by emitting photons. So that's how the photon uh, radiation happens or the gamma radiation happens. Now sometimes it can also happen that because of this energy loss is was so uh, high in the medium, uh, instead of emitting a photon, just two nuclei components like um, uh, two protons uh, can disintegrate from the nucleus and just, just get kicked off. This can also happen. So these are the ways uh, these radioactivity can happen. Now, uh, isotopes, for example, uh, let's take, take the case of tritium. It has two neutrons and one proton. So now if you increase the uh, 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 extra uh, uh, nucleon components, there is a very high chance that these kind of processes can happen. So that's why isotopes would uh, do radioactivity as opposed to stable uh, compounds. Um, sir, uh, can you repeat the last sentence? Yeah, so uh, we, for the case of tritium, there are two neutrons and one proton, right? Now, this uh, state is a bound state of three, three nucleons. Now, if you add keep on adding more stuff to a system it uh, it's uh, in general it can be an unstable system so this is what uh, would trigger a heavier um, isotope like tritium to become more radioactive as opposed to uh, yeah as opposed to the hydrogen hydrogen uh, nuclear okay sir so i have a doubt mm -hmm. So, like we tell matter is made up of atoms, right? Yes, so, and yeah. in matters like solid, atoms are tightly packed, right? So, how are they mm -hmm. tightly packed? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. I don't have anything to illustrate this. Uh, the thing is that uh, the atoms, they have something called valence valence shells. So if you think about it, the atoms have different ways of arranging the electrons within themselves, right? Um, now, these electrons in the outer shell of the, uh, of the atom, these are called valence electrons. So these electrons, and because they're so far away from the center, they can interact with similar electrons, that's the valence electrons from other atoms right? Uh, so it can form certain uh, bonds that, uh, that call in chemistry, I mean, this kind, this kind of interactions are called bonds. So these kind of bound states are responsible for, um, uh, you know, um, forming uh, larger, I mean, uh, larger systems of matter like solids, liquids, and, and gases. So it depends on how strong these bonds are. Uh, depending upon how strong these bonds are, uh, it would decide the fate of the state of this matter, whether it would be a, a solid or a liquid or a gas. So then like when we freeze water, so the uh, bonds become stronger? Yes, that's what's happening. So when you freeze the water, for example, when you freeze water, you are actually taking away some energy from them. Okay, so that would uh, actually bring these uh, bonds a little bit more stronger. So bonds, uh, it's a dynamic dynamic system. So there is an attractive force and there's also 
another uh, force which is responsible for breaking of the bond. So generally, when you heat stuff, bonds break. For example, let's let's do this experiment. Like put some solid uh, wax in a vessel and heat it up. So what is really happening is that when you heat this wax blob, uh, you are giving this wax a lot of energy. So then uh, when you do that, this energy uh, manifest as uh, kinetic energy of these atoms. The atom starts moving a little bit, so they're not really tied to each other in that kind of a motion. So that's why you would see uh, wax melting. Now, if you do the opposite, uh, you cool down this wax or cool down the water, you're taking away this energy so that these the atoms or molecules are not really vibrating. So that would uh, allow them to be in a state of bond. Uh, more tightly back. So then, like, if I have a solid, then if I can, um, s you know, give a lot of space to the, if I can uh, weaken the bond of these atom particles, then uh, can I, like, um, fill the solid in a very big space, like a football ground or something similar to that? So if you somehow try to reduce um, uh, the interaction of these particles uh, or the atom from each other, then you, you, then that kind of uh, matter will not be a solid anymore because now the atoms can move freely around each other without much interactions with each other. So this kind of uh, system is called a superfluid. Like it's, it can, it can move more freely. Uh, uh, it's more relaxed. It's it's not in really in a tight configuration like a, like a solid. So yeah, that's what would happen. You if you remove all uh, somehow if you are able to remove all the interaction, uh, interatomic interactions, then um, the the medium the material would then become a superfluid rather than a rather than a solid. It will not continue to exist in a solid. So, because like in industries, I have seen that the uh, hot cubes and all they, and the cubes of metal, like they flatten it and they increase the like the surface area. So, I, uh, if we can uh, um, really, you know, flatten it, then can we cover a big space? But it should be a solid. Oh, so yeah, I, I get where this question is coming from. Okay, so yeah, unfortunately, there's no easy way to remove these interactions between the atoms uh, other than first making them, heating them and making them into a semi-solid uh, or like a solid liquid stuff. Uh, so when you heat, what is really happening is that these bonds between the atoms break a little bit so that you, if you, if you strike hard with a other metal object, uh, it can um, become or assume a shape that you want it to become. So that's what's happening there. But unfortunately, there's no uh, way to really remove this, except for example, maybe you can melt the whole metal uh, and the metal become a fluid and then you can shape it into whatever shape you like and then start cooling it down. So then you get the shape that you desire. Okay, sir. So Thank does you, atom sir. have a, a specific shape uh, or specific color? No, at this level, uh, so what is color? Uh, this is an uh, interesting question. So when you look at, for example, you might have seen um, uh, the rainbow. So color is a property of the light that hits your retina, uh, your eyes. So uh, light comes with different frequencies and these various frequencies, um, uh, that's what is perceived as different color. So when you shine a little bit of light on the atom, atom might emit a certain other. So what happens is that this light might either get absorbed by the atom or it would simply do nothing or it would simply reflect this light. Now, if you if the atom just reflect the light, you would see, um, yeah, I mean, you would see the light that you, you 
you, you won't see anything interesting happening. But if it absorbs the light, then uh, you you would then what the atom can do is that it can even emit a different frequency of light back at you, and you would see a different color of the atom. Now, this is in some sense this is what's happening uh, in certain certain situations. For example, you probably have seen um, uh, electric lamps, which are sodium vapor lamps or even mercury vapor lamps. Uh, let, let's talk about sodium vapor lamps. So, so what happens in sodium vapor lamp is, uh, so there are certain, um, if you excite the sodium atom in the sodium vapor lamp in a specific way, using electricity, but not by sending light, but you can also excite using uh, electricity. Then uh, the sodium atoms emit a particular frequency of light. So that's why you would see that yellow light uh, that's very characteristic of sodium vapor lamps. You can see this as street lights in any city. Uh, so in that sense, atoms have, can show a little bit of color, but it's not like whether you what you really experience uh, in daily life. Like for example, uh, the screen behind me is a, a white color or something like that. So that kind of property doesn't exist for an atom. So, yeah. if I search um, helium on Google, then I am then I I get to see some boil purple color. So, is that the color of helium? If we um, uh, group them together, or yeah. So I don't know what exactly you search for, but I do not. Yeah, I mean, as I said in, in the previous explanation, atoms by themselves doesn't have a color, but uh, if you excite them in a specific way, um, you can make them to emit certain particular color from them, particular light from them. I think what you're referring is the helium, helium lab, maybe, but I'm not sure. Let me see what, what you did. Yeah, okay, so this is, uh, yeah, so uh, it's the light from the helium lamp. So th that's again, something similar to the sodium lamp. If you excite uh, the helium atom in a specific way, it can emit uh, certain frequencies and it's the frequency of the light that you you see and that's the frequency, the frequency of the light is associated with a particular color and that's the color you would see from helium. So yes, in that sense, Helium can be made to emit a specific color, but by itself so, it doesn't have a color. So, so, for that we need to add something in the helium? No, you don't need to add anything extra. All that you have to do is you have to uh, find a way to give energy to helium. So you can do that using electricity. You can put the helium in a maybe a gas tube, like take a uh, they call Krug's tube, uh, but just just take a cylinder uh, which is filled with cylinder uh, with uh, helium, and then you put the cylinder. Uh, you put two electrodes and a positive electrode and a negative electrode, and then you start applying an electric uh, current across these uh, uh, electrodes, and it, helium would start emitting light. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Um, will that color is uh, if we will that color is if we uh, switch off the lights, then will mm -hmm. it glow? That. So not all atoms has this property. So for radium. example, yeah. So radium does it because radium you don't have to give anything to radium. Radium once in a while starts emitting these. Uh, uh, radioactive particles. Uh, so for ra radioactive particles, you, radioactive elements, you don't have to do anything. It just starts emitting stuff right from its nuclear. Now, all that I mentioned now, I mean, all these questions that you asked now uh, regarding the color of these uh, elements, uh, sodium or helium, 
this doesn't happen because of the nuclear interactions. This happens because the electrons in these atoms behave a specific way when you put certain electric potential or electric current to it. Uh, and for certain kind of materials, it's known that um, if you give them energy via an electric uh, current or something, uh, they will emit light, but they will also emit light even after you remove the electric current. Uh, they will emit this light after even after a while. So this property of these materials are called uh, phosphorescence. Phosphorescence, sorry, phosphorescence. Yeah, uh, and if this is because these uh, these atoms or the electrons in the atoms get excited. Uh, after you apply an energy and uh, during the de-excitation or it, it goes to a higher energy level and when you remove this electric current uh, it goes back to this previous configuration after some while. Now this delay is what is responsible for um, uh, emission of this light after a while. So that property is called phosphorescence. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sir, can sound waves generate heat? Uh, so, yeah, in some sense, yes, but it's not. Um, so let's ask this question. So, what what uh, what do you mean by 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 heat? Now. Um, Let's talk about uh, heating a glass of uh, water or a pot of water. So what really happens is that you are sending certain uh, energy, like I mean, you put this whole uh, uh, glass of water on a on a stove or something, and then uh, yeah, you turn it on. So heat energy is transferred to this contents in this glass, which is water. So what really happens is that there are certain modes of excitation of these uh, molecules, the water molecules, and they started start vibrating. That's why this whole contents of this glass will set in motion. That's why you see all these boiling happening. Now, this happens at a very particular frequency uh, because uh, these vibrations of uh, water molecules can happen at a very particular frequency. Uh, so this is why you can also heat water in a microwave. So microwave radiations can uh, excite these water molecules uh, at that particular frequency. And that would set these water molecules in motion and that heats up the stuff, whatever is uh, your food particles, which also contains water. Now it's probably possible to do uh, heat up certain things by sound waves, but it has to be at extreme high frequencies. Uh, that frequency of sound waves would not be something we can uh, we can hear. Uh, it would. It, I think it will have to be extremely high frequency. Although I don't know if anyone has done this, but this is this is my guess. That's a that's a good question. So I. I don't really readily have an answer to that. Uh, need to think about it a bit. So this question in the chat, Rishikesh is asking why water is not emitting light when it is heated? Oh, so water, um, the, yeah, the frequency at which water starts vibrating, uh, this vibration frequency is not uh, in the so when when something has to emit light so there has to have there has to be a transition of energy levels in the atom which must correspond to the frequency which is in the um, which is in the uh, you know uh, frequency of the light rays so if you heat water uh, you're not exciting those modes of vibrations of water but there are other ways light uh, uh, can be emitted by water. For example, uh, if you look at the um, look at the ocean, sometimes the ocean is uh, is blue. So what is really happening here is that light get absorbed by water, and then it uh, certain parts of this gets absorbed by water, 
and then uh, it um, yeah i mean uh, you get effectively that part component of light filtered and absorbed by water and you get the remaining component of the light which would be blue so that's uh, that's what's happening uh, in case of uh, water so uh, yeah i mean just by heating you cannot get these kind of uh, an effect out of water 